So here we are again to wrap up glycolysis, part two of this lecture series. Still we're on chapter 17 of the, uh, of the course textbook, uh, but this is going to be the first of two chunks that wrap up glycolysis, so this is lecture 12. We will start off this chunk by talking about the second stage of glycolysis. We'll finish up what we started in the last lecture, and we will take those two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate of GAP and we'll process them all the way to be two molecules of pyruvate. We'll also talk in the next chunk about regulating glycolysis, how we turn this process on and off, and we'll take a small side detour to talk about how pyruvate can be metabolized anaerobically when oxygen is limiting. That's both in our own muscle cells as well as in other organism types. We'll wrap up the entire lecture series at the end of the second chunk by talking about how glycolysis gives us energy, both in the forms of ATP formation as well as reduced electron carriers. So let's remind ourselves where we left off. This is our roadmap, of course. And in the last lecture, we were able to see how two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate could be made from glucose. Well, that took a number of steps and different reaction types. Remember, we ended off by making one molecule of GAP and one of DHAP, but then triose phosphate isomerase was able to isomerize DHAP into a second molecule of GAP, leaving us where we are now. So, from this point moving forward, we're going to do everything in duplicate. We're going to have two parallel reactions going every step of the way now. Each GAP molecule is going to be processed identically to the other. So everything we talk about, keep in mind, is going to be happening two times over. One molecule of glucose yielded two identical molecules of GAP, and so those two GAP molecules are going to be par processed in parallel. We burned two ATP molecules in the last lecture series. Today we'll start making some ATP to break even, and then we'll even make an ATP profit, which is the payoff phase. So let's jump right back in. If we left off on step five, we're going to pick up here on step six, and this step is our first real bona fide redox reaction. This step is also a two different reaction type kind of rolled into one, so this is almost a twofer. Along with that redox, we also see a phosphorylation event, and even though these two aspects of the reaction are happening simultaneously, there's a redox and a phosphorylation, we will discuss these two separately just to try to keep it as clear as possible. But do keep in mind, even though we'll talk about them separately, it's occurring all at once in this one reaction scheme. The oxidation uh, that we're going to see here results in substrate gaining in oxygen. We saw that before even in our more generic examples. That's why these are called oxidations. So we'll take a look at that as well. Here we see glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate combined with NAD and an inorganic phosphate group becomes a molecule called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Well, here's our glycerate backbone. Remember, bisphospho means two different phosphate groups in two different locations. We saw that already with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And the two locations are given to us by the numbers. So there is one phosphate group on carbon 1. We see that here. And another phosphate group on carbon 3. We see that here. In addition to this phosphorylation event, whoops, up here in carbon 1, we also see that we've reduced NAD to NAD plus H. So if we focus on the latter half of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we see that it's completely unchanged. Everything we're talking about in the catalysis of this reaction is occurring up here. And because this is an oxidation reaction, we gained an oxygen. Well, can we see where that oxygen has been gained? If we look over here, we see that this is a carbonyl carbon with a double bonded oxygen to it, and it is still a carbonyl carbon with a double bonded oxygen to it. But look what happens to this proton. This proton and the electrons with it get ripped off of gap and shuttled over to NAD, and in its place becomes an oxygen. So that's the oxidation reaction there. I've already kind of given it away, but we can see what has been reduced. NAD has been reduced to NADH plus H. We can see the gain of protons, but we know that where the protons go, the electrons had followed, so that means NAD gained electrons, making it a reduced version of itself. And in this case, NAD is, of course, acting like the coenzyme, allowing the reaction to proceed, giving the electrons a place to go. The redox reaction of step six is exergonic. It is energy releasing. It has an overall delta G of negative 43.1 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot. That's about 10 kilojoules per mole more than busting open an ATP, to put it into some context. But remember that redox reaction is only half of the reaction. 
The phosphorylation reaction that's occurring here is actually endergonic. It requires energy. And it's actually being added as a dehydration reaction. Uh, we, we see a release of water here in order to get this molecule um, phosphorylated. This phosphate group is not being donated by ATP because we don't require coupling here. The energy for this reaction is coming from the redox reaction point, and so we can just use plain old inorganic phosphate, free phosphate, as our phosphate donor. Again, it's a dehydration reaction, so water was removed. When we strip away water from that phosphate group, that phosphate is left uh, unsatisfied. It has a pair of electrons that it needs to make a bond with, and those electrons can go ahead and pair up with that carbonyl carbon and allow this phosphate group to be added. So the carbonyl carbon moves to accommodate the addition of the phosphate group. We gain an oxygen through that oxidation reaction, and we can make 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That portion of the reaction, the uh, phosphorylation event, is endogonic, as I said, with a positive delta G of 49.3 kilojoules per mole, uh, but it can be fueled by the energy released by the redox reaction. So let's take another look at the two individual components of this reaction independently. We spend a lot of, st of time on step six because it is the most complicated step of glycolysis. So in the previous slide, we were looking at the phosphorylation and the redox reaction occurring in the same reaction scheme. Let's instead break that up and look at these two reaction types separately. So first, we'll just look at the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Here we see glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Here's the glyceride backbone. And we see that phosphate coming off of carbon-3. And when the reaction has proceeded, we see that carbon-1 has been oxidized. The protons and electrons have been removed, and an oxygen has been put in its place. This actually gives us, one, uh, gives us three phosphoglycerate. Since those electrons were removed from carbon-1, they had to go somewhere, and they went on to NAD, creating NADH plus H. Separately, we can consider the phosphorylation reaction. Here, the phosphorylation occurs when this free phosphate group, this inorganic phosphate group, combines with the oxygen we just gained through the oxidation and allows us to link that phosphate group to carbon-1, creating 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And we've said it before, but that is a dehydration reaction, and so we release a molecule of water as well. So the redox reaction involves the stripping of electrons and the adding of an oxygen atom. The phosphorylation involves adding a free phosphate to that oxygen atom, giving us a second phosphate group on 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, 1,3-BPG. Uh, you might have picked it up by the individual delta Gs that I gave you in the last slide, but this overall reaction is slightly endergonic taken in total. The overall delta G of all of step 6 is positive 6.2 kilojoules per mole. But just as, and, and also keep in mind that everything we're doing with doing in parallel, so what we do in step six to one of those gap molecules, we're also doing to another. That means step six in total actually has a delta G of 12.4 kilojoules per mole positive. Uh, we've simply doubled this 6.2 to, to capture the fact that we've done this to two gap molecules. Uh, but we'll see later when we talk about the energetics of glycolysis how and why these endergonic reactions are driven forward. The enzyme responsible for catalyzing step six is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. That enzyme converts glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or GAP, into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 1,3-BPG. Uh, if we think about the name of this enzyme, we'll kind of appreciate the fact that it too tells us what it does. It dehydrogenases, whatever that means for now, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So the substrate name is in the enzyme name. We know we're working on GAP, so that kind of positions us in glycolysis. But let's think about that dehydrogenase name a little bit more. Dehydrogenase sounds to me like I'm removing hydrogens, right? If I dephosphorylate, I'm removing uh, phosphate groups. If I degrease, I'm removing grease. If I de-ice a plain wing, I'm removing ice. So dehydrogenase kind of sounds like I'm removing hydrogens. And we know that if hydrogens are removed, what must follow? Electrons. So if we think of dehydrogenases as enzymes that remove hydrogens, we can also think of them as enzymes that remove electrons. And if we think of dehydrogenases in that way, we quickly come to realize that these enzymes are responsible for catalyzing redox reactions. And we will see that emerge again and again as we continue on with glucose metabolism. Dehydrogenase enzymes in general
are our redox reaction catalyzing enzymes. A little bit more specifically, this enzyme belongs to a very large class of enzymes that are referred to as NADH linked to dehydrogenases. Not surprisingly, that means that NAD is actually linked to the enzyme itself initially, and NAD is serving as the electron repository for these redox reactions. So these enzymes are linked to NAD in its oxidized form. That helps them steal hydrogens and electrons from substrate, converting NAD to NADH plus H, and then that NADH plus H in its reduced form is released by the enzyme. So kind of the come full circle here, here's our reaction. GAP is oxidized, reducing NAD, as well as phosphorylated, turning glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, catalyzed by the enzyme GAP dehydrogenase. And we've covered it already, but let that substrate and product name tell you how the um, product looks. So 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is telling us that we have two phosphates on two different carbons, carbon 1 and carbon 3. So that's step 6, and it is a doozy. That lands us here in the scheme of glycolysis with two molecules of 1,3-BPG. Two of these because everything we're doing is, is in parallel. Now there's something important you need to know about 1,3-BPG. It does not like the phosphate that we just stuck onto it. It does not like that phosphate that we jammed onto carbon-1 a moment ago. And I mean, it really doesn't like that phosphate group. In fact, we call this property having a high phosphate transfer potential. And if you think of what that phrase means, what we mean is we have a very high potential, it's very, very likely, that this molecule is going to transfer that phosphate it doesn't like. It hates that phosphate on carbon-1 so much that it's eager to get rid of it, kind of like a strong acid is so eager to get rid of its protons. In fact, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, 1,3-BPG, so badly wants to give up that phosphate, it actually wants to give that phosphate up more badly than ATP wants to give up its phosphate. In other words, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate has a higher phosphate transfer potential than ATP itself. ATP being the high energy molecule whose sole job is to transfer, uh, transfer phosphates. And so if we combine 1,3-BPG and ADP, we can phosphorylate ADP with that phosphate. Let's use an analogy to kind of get this uh, across if we can. I live in Longmeadow, and as I'm sure it's no surprise to many of you, Longmeadow is a fairly affluent town, and um, for, for better or for worse, that's the town I live in. I live in a lot of, uh, among a lot of people that have uh, more money than I can ever dream of having, which is fine, I'm okay with that, but that's Longmeadow. So imagine some rich Longmeadow person just bought themselves like an incredible TV, like state-of-the-art, unbelievable, super high-def, mega screen, like a theater-in-your-home TV. And because of that, this individual really has no need for their old TV anymore. They really don't want their old TV. They're looking to get rid of it because they got something better. We can say that an individual such as this has a high TV transfer potential. They have a TV they really don't want. They're looking to get rid of it. They want it off their hands, just like 1,3-BPG really doesn't want that phosphate on its first carbon, really wants to get it off its hands. I'm ADP in this analogy. I have or had a high TV transfer potential, but this rich person's TV transfer potential is higher than mine. In other words, he doesn't want that TV he wants that TV, he doesn't want that TV more than I do want it. That's a perfectly good TV. Look how big it is. It looks so nice. Well, I'll take it. If he's so eager to get rid of that TV, I'll grab it up. With all that money I'm spending on daycare, remember? I'm still in the red. I'll take any TV I can find. And so his trash becomes my treasure. What he is giving up, I readily receive. Now, to be fair, if that was an old, crappy, black and white TV that you had to change channels by hand, I don't need a TV that badly. I wouldn't take that TV. In fact, if I had a TV such as that, I'd be trying to get rid of it. So it's not as though I'll take any TV, but this TV? I'll take this TV because this guy's TV transfer potential is higher than mine. Again, in the analogy, this rich snot is 1,3-BPG so eager to get rid of a perfectly good phosphate group. And I am ADP, 
I won't accept any phosphate group, but if you're trying to get rid of a high energy phosphate group, I'll take that. I'll gobble that up. That trash is my treasure. And so I will accept that phosphate becoming a TP, taking on that third phosphate on my molecule. So in step seven, we have this scenario where 1,3-BPG will give up its phosphate that it so desperately doesn't want, and in doing so, provide enough energy in that phosphate to trigger the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. So that is step seven. Finally, we're going to make some ATP after all this that we've already invested in glycolysis. Step seven starts with 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, that high phosphate transfer potential molecule with a phosphate on carbon one and carbon three. All we have to do is mix in some ADP. Now 1,3-BPG has a place to give that phosphate up to, and ATP is willing to accept it. We see that the, at the end of the reaction, we have three phosphoglycerate, a single phosphate group on this molecule, uh, on the third carbon, and ADP has been phosphorylated to ATP. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphoglycerate kinase, and if you look very carefully at that enzyme name, you will realize that it is actually named for the reverse reaction. The name of this enzyme tells us that it is an enzyme that adds phosphates to phosphoglycerates. That's actually not what it's doing here. Here, it is allowing phosphoglycerate to be made by releasing a phosphate. So keep in mind and make a note that step seven, the enzyme is named for the reverse reaction. Again, to say it succinctly, in this reaction, a phosphate group is transferred from 1,3-BPG directly to ADP, leaving us with 3-PG, or 3-phosphoglycerate, and ATP. This reaction works and is energetically favorable because the energy released by 1,3-BPG giving up that phosphate, the phosphate it wants to lose so badly, fuels and triggers the phosphorylation of ADP. In other words, the energy contained in the bond between carbon-1 and that phosphate group is higher and is released in this reaction. Uh, it, that energy is higher than the energy we need to put that phosphate back onto ADP. This is an energy releasing reaction. The universe makes an energy profit. Um, the release of that phosphate from 1,3-BPG releases 49.3 kilojoules per mole. It takes 30 and a half kilojoules per mole to add a phosphate to ADP. And so the universe is making about a 19 kilojoule per mole profit here. So this reaction proceeds and it proceeds readily. In fact, this reaction is so energetically favorable that this reaction occurring is what pulls step six along, even though step six is a little bit endergonic. The universe permits step six to occur so that 1,3-BPG will be made for step seven. This reaction type is called substrate level phosphorylation. Hopefully for obvious reasons, we are phosphorylating one substrate with another. Two substrate molecules are involved, 1,3-BPG and ADP, and one substrate is being used to phosphorylate another. That is substrate level phosphorylation. So here is step six. 1,3-BPG converted to 3-PG, and ATP is made along the side. Remember, everything we're doing in this phase of glycolysis, we are doing in duplicate because we have two molecules of gap that we started with. So we didn't just make one ATP, we just made two, because everything we do, we do in parallel, which means this is our break-even step. The two ATPs we burned in step one and in step three of glycolysis, we just broke even because we made two ATPs here. Step eight. Here we start with one with three phosphoglycerate and we change that to two phosphoglycerate. We're really just moving a phosphate group from one carbon to another. The movement of phosphate groups and phosphate groups alone are not considered by um, hardcore chemists to, to be isomerization reactions because the entire molecule is not really being completely rearranged. The glycerate backbone of this molecule stays intact. The only thing being moved is a phosphate group. So we don't use isomerase in these enzyme names. We use the word mutase for this. So the enzyme is catalyzed, this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase um, because we're only moving a phosphate group. And we make 3PG um, into 2PG. So I have no problem with you calling this an isomerization reaction for the purposes of this class. Uh, it is a rearrangement of the molecule. 
But because it is what chemists would call an intramolecular phosphate transfer, in other words, the phosphate is being removed from one carbon and, and then popped onto another, a uh, hardcore chemist would not really be okay with this being an isomerization reaction. As far as we're concerned, though, we've rearranged the molecule, we've moved the phosphate group, and so, again, if you want to think of this as an isomerization, I see no harm in that. So 3PG becomes 2PG. That's step 8 of glycolysis. Step 9 is the second dehydration reaction we will occur and that we will encounter in this process. Of course, that means that 2PG is losing an oxygen and two hydrogens, yielding water. When you do strip one oxygen and two hydrogens, and you'll find them um, here, we're taking this hydroxyl group and this carbon, creating a double bond between carbon number uh, two and three. When you remove that and yield water, you've created a molecule called phosphoenolpyruvate. Phosphoenolpyruvate is an extremely important molecule for two reasons, which we'll see in step 10. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called enolase, uh, which of course comes from the fact that you have made this enol. So uh, phosphoenolpyruvate is made by the enzyme enolase. And if you look in that name, you'll see something that is um, refreshing for us at this point. We are close to making pyruvate. We have made a pyruvate derivative, so we're pretty close to where we need to be. Step 9, 2-phosphoglycerate converted into PEP, or phosphoenolpyruvate, via a dehydration reaction catalyzed by enolase. And so finally, step 10, our last step of glycolysis where we will make pyruvate. Here, the phosphate group on PEP is going to be transferred because it, too, now has a high phosphate transfer potential. PEP does not like that phosphate on its second carbon. That phosphate is creating some steric interference. It's a high-energy bond. The energy in that bond is higher than the energy we need to put that phosphate onto ADP, and so we can make that conversion in step 10. We will release about 62 kilojoules per mole by breaking the bond between the phosphate and uh, what is pyruvate. And we only need, again, 30 and a half kilojoules per mole to phosphorylate ADP. Universe loves this reaction. It's releasing about 32 kilojoules per mole. And by mixing PEP and ADP, we can phosphorylate that ADP with that last phosphate. So PEP becomes pyruvate when it yields that inorganic phosphate group and uses the energy of that reaction to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. The double bond between uh, carbon 2 and 3 now shifts, and it allows the carbon to become a carbonyl carbon, carbon 2, to become a carbonyl carbon with the oxygen that the phosphate group has left behind. So this phosphate, uh, this phosphate group's removal allows the double bond shown here to shift and become the double bond with this oxygen. We pick up one proton in order to satisfy carbon-3. Uh, but this is a substrate-level phosphorylation, just as we saw two steps ago. And it is a phosphate transfer reaction, because we're moving that phosphate to ADP. And again, just as we said before, everything we're doing, we're doing in duplicate. So we didn't just make one ATP, and we didn't just make one pyruvate. We made two of each. And so we have made our two pyruvate molecules that we've been after all along. And we've made two ATPs, which are profit. We broke even in step eight, and so these are our profit ATPs, the two ATPs that I promised you we would make in glycolysis. The enzyme responsible for catalyzing step 10 is pyruvate kinase. It is another one of these named for the reverse reaction uh, enzymes. Pyruvate kinase sounds like an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to pyruvate, and in fact, we just removed a phosphate group to create pyruvate. So just as we said before, uh, do keep in mind that this is named for the reverse reaction. Pyruvate kinase is inhibited by ATP because if we have plenty of energy on hand, we do not need to finish glycolysis. Step 10 of glycolysis, the removal of a phosphate group transferred onto ADP, yielding pyruvate done in parallel. And that's it. Man, wipe your brow. That was a lot, right? That's glycolysis in all of its glory. A 10-step process. Please keep in mind that I want you to know this process in detail. Uh, at a minimum, you must know the enzyme names, but I expect that your knowing of the enzyme names will lead you to the correct substrates and products for each of these reactions. So no glycolysis inside and out.
So to summarize this lecture chunk, we completed glycolysis as a process. We went through our entire roadmap. In this lecture chunk specifically, we started with GAP, and we watched as GAP was both oxidized and phosphorylated to yield 1,3-BPG, a very unstable molecule with a high phosphate transfer potential. Since that was a redox reaction there in step six, we also reduced NAD to NADH plus H. Some of those high power electrons will be used much later in glucose metabolism. We went on to take 1,3-BPG and leverage that high phosphate transfer potential to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. We made two ATP molecules here, breaking even from the early stages of glycolysis, and we yield from this reaction 3-phosphoglycerate, 3-PG. Between you and me, we isomerized 3PG into 2PG, moving the phosphate group from carbon 3 to carbon 2. And then in step 9, we take that 2PG and we dehydrate it, creating a molecule that is still phosphorylated but is now phosphoenol pyruvate. That is catalyzed by enolase. And the last step of glycolysis, step 10, takes PEP with its own high phosphate transfer potential allows PEP to lose that phosphate group to ADP, creating two new ATP molecules for us, which is profit from this reaction. But much more importantly, we make two molecules of pyruvate, the end goal and the whole point of glycolysis. So hopefully glycolysis sits well from a biochemical perspective. We will move on in the next lecture chunk to talk a little bit about the regulation of this process, how the cell can control it, turn glycolysis on and turn glycolysis off, and we'll also speak a little bit about the energetics of this reaction scheme overall. Until then, thanks so much for watching.